Have you ever wondered about the ecology and behavior of our closest relatives in the animal kingdom, the great apes and other primates? Did you know that almost half the world's primate species are threatened with extinction? Zoologists officially recognize over 630 species of primates. The primate order includes lemurs, lorises, tarsiers, new world monkeys, old world monkeys, lesser apes, and the great apes, which includes us humans. The earliest primates appeared in the fossil record about 55 million years ago, and the earliest human hominid relatives, Australopithecus, appeared about 3 million years ago. What do we mean when we call something a primate? Zoologists consider primates to be generalist mammals, which means they're able to survive in a wide variety of environments, not a narrow ecological niche. Within the order, primates show a wide range of adaptations and physical characteristics, but we can make a few generalizations. Primates have longer childhoods and longer lifespans than other mammals of a similar size. They also have larger brains relative to their body size than most other mammals. Primates rely more on sight and less on smell than other mammals. They eat a variety of diets, but almost all of them are capable of omnivory. A few, like gorillas, are primarily herbivores, and tarsiers are the lone carnivorous exception. They survive mostly on insects. And of course, many, but not all of them, have opposable thumbs, along with flat fingernails rather than claws, and sensitive pads on each digit for gripping. Strangely enough, the only trait that is common to all primates is an auditory bulla made of specialized temporal bone. In other words, an inner ear made of the side bone of the skull. Despite being generalists, most modern primates live in the subtropical and tropical forests of the world. Humans are one of the few that naturally make their homes in the temperate and subarctic climates. The fact that primates are natural forest dwellers shouldn't surprise us, because those primate adaptations I just listed for you are ideal for life in the trees. We can see this arboreal ancestry in the oldest primate-like animal that's ever been discovered, a small, tree-dwelling creature known as Archecebus achilles, Archecebus meaning ancient monkey. These little fellows are now extinct, but they were probably pretty similar in appearance to the smallest known living primate, Madame Bertha's mouse lemur, or Microcebus berthi, from the subtropical forests of Madagascar. This mouse lemur is less than 10 centimeters long and weighs only about 30 grams, or the weight of only 90 U.S. pennies, and it's a tree-dwelling omnivore. But before we get into the details of these adaptations, let's look at the living members of the primate order. The modern primate group includes two suborders. The first is the suborder Strepsorhini, or wet-nosed pre-monkeys, which includes the lemurs, Chifacas and Ai Ai, which consist of about 22 species in 12 genera of four distinct families which inhabit the large island of Madagascar, as well as the bush babies or galagos and lorises, 33 species in several genera which inhabit Asia and Africa. The other suborder within the primates is suborder Haplorhini, the dry nosed primates, sometimes called higher primates. These include the infraorder Tarsiaformis, the seven species of Tarsiers, as well as the infraorder Simiaformis, basically everything else. The Simiaformis include the New World monkeys of Central and South America, 30 species in 11 genera, as well as a group of small animals without prehensile tails, the 25 species of New World marmosets and tamarins in five genera. Families in this suborder from the Old World, meaning Africa and Asia, include the Cercopithecoidea, the baboons, macaques, and others, a family that includes 82 species in 14 genera. This suborder also includes nine species of lesser apes, including all gibbons and the siamang, as well as the four species of great apes, the bonobo or pygmy chimp, the common chimpanzee, 
the orangutan, and the gorilla. And of course, humans are considered dry-nosed primates. It is thought that old and new world monkeys diverged when the continents of South America and Africa diverged about 120 million years ago. The new world monkeys include another competitor for the world's smallest primate, the common pygmy marmoset that lives in habitats at the edge of forests in northern South America. These marmosets are only about 13 centimeters long and weigh just under 120 grams on average. That's about four ounces. The world's largest primate belongs to the great ape group. It's the gorilla, which weighs about four pounds at birth and reaches an adult weight of 160 to 215 pounds for females and over 400 pounds for males. Let's look at what these family groupings mean. The Cebidae, or New World Monkeys, have a distinctive platyrine or broad nose shape with nostrils that are wide apart and face outward, appearing open. The Circopathesidae, or Old World Monkeys, have a catarine or downward nose shape with nostrils that are close together, narrowly spaced, and pointing downward. You can see this distinction pretty clearly if you look at the platyrine golden lion tamarind versus the catarine Allen's swamp monkey. Besides this distinction, several of the New World monkeys have prehensile tails that work like a fifth hand, while the tails of Old World monkeys are sometimes used as a balancing or rudder-like appendage that aids in leaping and climbing, not for grasping. At other times, they have much smaller tails or a vestigial tail stub. As primates evolved from the dog-like lemurs to great apes and humans, there was a flattening of our faces as the muzzle decreased in size. Although olfaction is the dominant sense in most mammals, we can no longer smell as well as dogs can, and our brain's olfactory lobe has decreased in size as well. We have stereoscopic vision with our forward-facing eyes, and our optic lobe has increased in size. This trait was initially an adaptation to life in the trees. Our primate ancestors needed stereoscopic vision to judge distance as they leaped from branch to branch in the trees. Primates have also developed color vision as we have increased our reliance on our visual abilities. As primates advanced, they developed longer lifespans and time of maternal care, which gives in infants a higher chance of survival and a time for social learning. This behavior is associated with delayed sexual maturity and a longer inner birth interval, which also allowed an increase in the complexity of social behavior. The mating behavior of primates is very diverse. Primate breeding systems include monogamous pairs, single males that control harems, also called single male polygyny, in which dominant males monopolize access to their harems, and even multi-male polygyny. For example, troops of baboons, in which many breeding males associate in the same troop with multiple females. Many primates are sexually dimorphic, which includes body size, canine tooth size, and even coloration. All of these traits are noticeable in gorillas, in which the dominant male is much larger than the females, has a silver back, and is called a silver back, and even has enlarged canines compared to female canines. As primates evolved and radiated into different environments, the sizes and shapes of their bodies changed to adapt to these environments. This explains the similar adaptations among diverse groups, from the terrestrial ring-tailed lemurs and baboons to the leaping shafakas, tail-swinging spider monkeys, and brachiating lesser apes. The quadrupedal primates tend to have narrow rib cages, long backs, and long pelvic blades. The leaping and brachiating primates tend to have a more vertical posture, more barrel-like chests, and shorter pelvic blades. Interestingly, although the quadrupedal primates have arms and legs with similar lengths, the leaping shafakas tend to have better developed hind limbs to provide power for long jumps. The brachiating lesser apes, in contrast, 
have relatively longer and stronger arms and reduced legs. In humans, leg length has increased so slightly because we are long distance runners and arms are relatively shorter. The type of locomotion primates use is also reflected in the feet and hands. The quadrupedal primates have small, relatively divergent thumbs, while brachiating apes and monkeys have thumbs that are greatly reduced as an adaptation for clean grabs of branches and vines. In our ape relatives, the thumb is well-developed and gives us strong gripping ability and dexterity when we oppose it to our fingers. I mentioned earlier that primates have the greatest brain size relative to body size of almost all animals. And we know that behavioral flexibility is related to both the relative and absolute brain size. What's interesting here is how that brain size is achieved. I'm sure you're all familiar with the wrinkled appearance of the human brain. Those wrinkles, or more accurately folds, are a way of fitting a greater brain volume and cognitive capacity into a smaller space. Think of it this way. Imagine a flat piece of tin foil in the palm of your hand. When you crumple it up, it takes much less space on your palm, practically no space at all, but it still has the same volume. That's how you fit a lot of brain into a small space. If we look at other primates, we see various levels of folding that are very consistent with the intelligence of the animal. A chimpanzee's brain looks a lot like a human's, just a bit smaller. Compare that to the brain of macaques, which is significantly smoother. So there is an obvious relationship between folding and intelligence. And we can say that this complex folding is an evolutionary example of function over form. Let's take a deeper look at a couple of different primates, one new world monkey and one great ape, to get a better sense of the true diversity and fascinating adaptations among the primate order. We'll start with the golden lion tamarind, a new world monkey from South America that has a special place in Smithsonian's National Zoo. Because Smithsonian science, zoo breeding, and reintroduction programs are bringing this animal back from the brink of extinction. The four species of lion tamarins are potentially the most beautiful mammals I have ever seen or heard. With their colorful golden fur, lion-like manes surrounding their beautiful faces, and bird-like vocalizations. They live in family groups of four to eight individuals. And you'll remember that in an earlier lecture, we discussed how adolescent golden lion tamarins participate in rearing the babies. So these groups are quite close knit. All four species of lion tamarind are endangered. The golden lion tamarind, the golden headed lion tamarind, the golden rumped lion tamarind, and the black lion tamarind, all of which live in the coastal forests of Brazil that are now the most densely inhabited area of the country. Like most primates, these beautiful primates are omnivores, eating small vertebrates, insects, fruits and flowers, and plant gums or nectar whenever these food items are available. The tamarins were once thought to be an older lineage of primates, but are now thought to be a recently dwarfed line of primates only about 13 million years old. And when I say dwarfed, I'm not talking about what animal breeders do. I'm talking about insular dwarfism. In nature, a large species often becomes smaller when a population's range is restricted. We often think of island-dwelling species developing dwarf forms, thus the name insular. But these don't have to be literal item islands. The tamarins evolved in biological islands of unique tropical forest on mainland South America. And the lion tamarins in particular evolved in unique areas of Atlantic rainforest in the coastal areas of Brazil. The deforestation of Brazil's Atlantic coasts began as early as the 1500s when European colonists began clearing the land for logging, ranching, and charcoal production. The settlers replanted these lands with sugarcane, then coffee, then cattle grazing grasses. 
habitat destruction near Rio de Janeiro increased dramatically in the 1970s after a critical road was built that connected growing human populations in the city to the countryside and increased access to the previously remote forests. Even the Poço das Antas Reserve, officially established in the mid-1970s, has been bisected by a railroad, a road, and a dam that would flood some of the forest. The guard force at the reserve has never been enough to protect the remaining lion tamarins there, and only about one-third of the reserve was enough to provide suitable habitat for the lion tamarins remaining there. So now, the lion tamarins are restricted to mostly small and isolated fragments of forest known as remnant forests. Additionally, legal trade, followed by an illegal trade in wild animals within Brazil, contributed to the capture and sale of hundreds of these beautiful animals for biomedical research, for zoos, and for the international pet trade. Sometimes, local people in Brazil even eat these beautiful animals, in my opinion, a waste of such a world-renowned and amazing creature. By the mid-1960s, progressive modern zoos declared that import of these primates was not ethical. In the 1970s, an international conference was held to assess the status of wild and captive populations of the species and to improve care and well-being of captive animals. In 1996, when the animals were listed as critically endangered and the U.S. Species Survival Plan population for golden lion tamarins was about 400 animals, a cooperative international breeding and conservation program was developed for all zoos holding golden lion tamarins, and all zoos formally signed over ownership of their animals to the Brazilian government. Smithsonian scientists made several significant discoveries that have helped in the conservation of this species. First, as mentioned previously, National Zoo research biologist Deborah Kleiman a true scientific pioneer and global leader in studies of mammalian behavior, discovered that lion tamarins need their parent-raised adolescent offspring to help raise the next set of siblings for maximum success. These teenagers of lion tamarind society are also more successful raising their own offspring later due to their early babysitting experiences. This knowledge helped lion tamarind species survival program biologists to successfully manage the zoo-based breeding program while they augmented the global golden lion tamarind population. By 2003, their IUCN conservation status had improved just a bit, from critically endangered to endangered. Saving a species isn't simply a matter of successful breeding. You also have to introduce the animals to their habitat. And that not only means making the habitat ready for the species, but making the species ready for the habitat. So even with Deborah Kleiman's success at breeding these tamarins, there is still more work to be done. Starting in the 1970s, when less than 20% of the tamarin's original habitat remained, Smithsonian and university scientists worked with Brazilian ecologists to restore lion tamarin habitat. Now there is protected habitat, but only about 60% of this habitat is in patches of more than 2,000 acres, and most of these patches are less than 200 acres. The average size of these forest patches is less than the area needed for the home range of an average family group of five or six lion tamarins. Fires set by cattle ranchers around the protected forest fragments remain a continuous threat to the forest themselves and their tamarind inhabitants. At the same time, Smithsonian scientists worked with Brazilian scientists to plan and implement a reintroduction program to conserve these beautiful monkeys, a program that dramatically illustrates the role of zoo-based conservation efforts in conserving species. Smithsonian's National Zoo first developed the concept of free-ranging tamarinds on zoo grounds as a training program for those animals that were destined for reintroduction in natural habitat in Brazil. The golden lion tamarins born in captivity needed to be trained in skills necessary for survival in the wild, including locomotion in natural trees and vegetation, 
foraging around the forest, and even avoiding predators. Next, these animals were provisioned with food and were easily transported within the zoo in portable coolers that were modified to be nest boxes. They were, mod they were monitored in the zoo by animal behavior volunteers through the pre-release training process and learned to run and jump in the trees to avoid natural predators like hawks as well as people and to forage while free-ranging inside zoo grounds. Then, the tamarins were transported to Brazil, where they were released slowly from their home nest box coolers. They had extra food and continuing veterinary care while being monitored by field scientists. By the turn of the millennium, the reintroduced population totaled over 200 individuals and became the model for reintroductions of other lion tamarins and even other species. And as of now, the wild population numbers more than 3,000 individuals. The International Lion Tam Tamarind Conservation Group, based largely in zoos, continues to monitor the habitat and conservation status of these amazing animals. At the other size extreme of the primate order, we have the gorilla, the largest of all primates. Its size, chest-beating display, and intense gaze has given it a reputation as one of the fiercest and most dangerous of all animals. Despite the King Kong myth and legend that portrayed gorillas as horrors, American scientist George Schaller began close study of gorilla troops over 50 years ago. And these studies showed that these close relatives of humans really are peaceful and family-oriented. Yet human encroachment into and deforestation of the gorilla's Central African forest range has led to its current status as endangered. In fact, the Western lowland gorilla is critically endangered in the wild. Although decades ago, one of the main threats to adult gorillas was poachers, who killed the adults and captured the infants to sell to zoos. A modern threat is gorilla poaching for food and to sell skulls as souvenirs to tourists. Even where they are protected by laws on paper, these apes are often poached. And to add to the threats, Ebola virus has devastated populations of the gorilla. Gorilla group size varies from five to 10 animals and includes a dominant silverback male who is group leader, three adult females, and four or five offspring, sometimes including less mature adult uh, blackback males. Females breed only every six to eight years, so the youngsters in groups can be widely spaced by age. All groups have one silverback male, so any change in group size is based on female and offspring numbers. Gorillas are terrestrial, and they walk mostly on the knuckles of their forelimbs while walking on the soles of the feet of their hind limbs. Sometimes, lightweight adults climb into the trees where they typically nest, and youngsters can frequently be seen moving through the branches. Gorillas have such a heavy build. They have huge, broad, strong hands. You might be surprised to learn that such huge animals are primarily herbivores, or more accurately, folivores. These creatures eat leaves and stems of plants rather than the berries and even small vertebrates that their chimpanzee relatives consume. These plant parts are high in fibrous components, so gorillas have huge molars to grind their food, and they have large jaw muscles to sustain their chewing. Gorillas are sexually dimorphic, and males have much larger canines than females. Both sexes have a sagittal crest, the bony projection along the mid midline of the skull for muscle attachment. But the male's sagittal crest is so much larger than the female's that this is a defining characteristic of gorilla skull shape externally. Like humans, gorillas have a gestation period of about eight to nine months. Although the adults are huge compared to humans, the normally single newborns weigh only about four to five pounds. They begin to crawl at about age nine weeks and walk at two and a half to three and a half years of age. Gorilla infants are weaned around three years of age and females have an inner birth interval of about four years. 
This inner birth interval is consistent with a lactational anestrus. That's a period when the mother is nursing during which she is physiologically unable to get pregnant, which seems to be adaptive for mammals to most effectively raise infants to an optimal weight at weaning so they have a high chance of survival. And a really cool thing about gorilla infants is that they have a white spot at the base of their spine over the tailbone. This seems to signal to other gorillas that they are still kids. We have observed that infant gorillas with white tail spots can get away with just about any obnoxious behavior, even with their silverback father. Gorillas are found over a relatively small area of Central Africa, and their jungle habitat occurs over a broad range of elevations from sea level to over 12,000 feet above sea level in Eastern Africa. As folivores, gorillas can range over large home ranges in the montane and secondary forests where the shrubs, vines, and herbs that make up their leafy diet grow best. Leaf-eating animals like gorillas can live in relatively stable groups. Fruits and small vertebrates are distributed in clumpy patterns, not uniformly like leafy vines in jungles. And animals that depend on clumpy resources live in smaller groups and often defend their territories as chimp troops do. Indeed, in East Africa, where some gorillas